This is an auto-narrated audiobook by Google's computer-generated AI voices. Temporary Made is Book 5 in the Brides for Beasts Bear series by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel. Copyright 2023 by Lovestruck Romance, all rights reserved. Chapter 1 She's here. Of course she is. I thought she might be. It's the only reason I came to the Arts and Crafternoon event. My pulse picks up and a lump lodges itself in my throat at the sight of her. Alice. The only woman who's ever understood my penchant for Bronte over brawls, for Dickens over dumbbells. My soulmate. Yet she chose Waylon, a bear with the personality of a circus clown. Our eyes meet and I give her a slight nod. In return she flashes one of her heart-stopping smiles, the ones that make me feel like I've just gone ten rounds with a heavyweight champ. My pulse races. Then Waylon that overbearing, pun intended beast, wraps his arms around her and pulls her possessively against his chest. A clear she's mine message. And ouch that hurts. The BFB program, the Shifter Council's solution to the catastrophic shortage of eligible bachelorettes in town, is winding down. It's been wildly successful, for everyone but me. I watched couples pair off. I watched hearts and flowers dance in my buddy's eyes when they looked at their beautiful human fiancés. Yet here I stand, still single as a $1 bill. Typical. The bookish bear, the brainiac, the odd man out. The most pathetic part. I do want a wife. Kids even. I've got my home library of leather-bound classics to keep me company on lonely evenings, but like the others, I also wished for a family to make my life complete. My gaze drops from Alice's dazzling smile to her neck where Waylon's claiming mark is on full display. Damn. That's a kick to the gut. Alice is the woman of my dreams. I envisioned us curled up on the faux bear skin rug in front of a roaring fire in my home library, discussing the works of Hemingway or Tolstoy. Instead, she's with a bear whose idea of a good time is probably a round of mud wrestling followed by a farting contest. My jaw clenches as I watch them out of the corner of my eye entwined around a pottery wheel like Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore in Ghost. As I pass them my teeth grind so hard my jaw aches. Keep walking. Just keep walking. I do indeed keep moving, but my shifter hearing picks up Alice's voice, melodic and rich. Sweet torture to my ears. Poor Lake. He still hasn't found his fated mate. It looks like he might be the only one remaining single at the end of these festivities. The rest fades into obscurity as I increase my pace and speed as far away from them as I can get, right out the back door leading to the woods. Still, the sentiment sticks, twisting in my gut like a rusty knife. As I stomp through the trees, my fur ruffled, I breathe in the cool mountain air and try to allow it to soothe the upset my thwarted hopes have caused. I shouldn't have shown up today. I don't know what I was thinking. I've already chatted up every single woman in the program over the past ten days, all the desperate bride wannabes, and felt exactly nothing, zero spark, zero connection, zero attraction. I stomp deeper into the woods. I'll let my bear out for a good long run through the trees, then go home and sink my teeth into a juicy novel. Blake? I swing around, surprised that I was so preoccupied with my thoughts I hadn't even heard anyone behind me. The woman wiggles her fingers in a small wave. I know her. We've spoken a few times at the BFB events of the past few days, but I can't remember her name, so I stare blankly waiting for her to explain herself. She taps her chest. I'm Yumi. Remember, we talked at the cocktail party? You mentioned someone named Doe Eyes or something. I don't want to be rude and roll my eyes, but it's a struggle. I inquired if she was a fan of Dostoevsky. She replied with a bewildered look. Right now, however, there's a determined glint in her eye. I remember you, you me. Good. A wide but tremulous grin spreads over her face. That's good. Um, I've been thinking. And well, there's something I'd like to discuss with you. Yumi wraps her arms around herself protectively. I arch a brow. Go on. I'm listening. Okay. She takes a deep breath. This whole BFB thing hasn't quite worked out for either of us, right? I shrug then give a sharp nod. So, I've got a proposition. A proposition? I have to admit, my curiosity is piqued. Do tell. She looks both ways, as though someone might be out here eavesdropping in the woods, then leans in. 
I propose a mutually beneficial marriage of convenience. I blink at her. Twice. And by convenience, you mean? I mean you scratch my back, I scratch yours. You agree to my terms, I agree to yours. Interesting. I clear my throat. And what exactly do you imagine my terms to be? She looks down at the ground for a moment before continuing. I assume you'd like to get married and have children. Well, she's not wrong. And she must read that on my face because she continues, ticking off each specification on her fingers. I'll marry you, be a good wife, and... She hesitates for a moment. Even bear your children. Interesting. A transactional arrangement. It could work. Surprisingly, I don't hate the idea. I rub my chin, contemplating. My mind's already worrying with the pros and cons of this unexpected offer. Just when I think the pages of my love life are starting to read like a tragedy, this proposal could be the beginning of a very interesting new chapter. And what about your terms? As I ask, I watch her for any telltale signs of insanity. Nothing stands out as particularly off the rails and headed into Crazy Town Station. Her reply takes longer than I expect. Her eyes flit around nervously before meeting mine again. When our gazes connect, I see a raw determination in her depths. I need some financial help. Chapter 2 The air is scorching and stagnant. Heat rises from the concrete sidewalk in waves. The city's a simmering cauldron of sunshine and air pollution today. The combination of record high temperatures, vehicle emissions, and high levels of particulate matter creates another hazy layer of smog here in the city of angels. Hoisting my grocery bags higher, I shuffle along, praying for a miraculous wind chill. Grocery shopping on one of the hottest days of the year was admittedly not a smart move, especially for someone often considered to be one of the sharpest tools in the shed. Clearly not today. What can I say? I couldn't stand being cooped in our dingy one-bedroom apartment for another second. Plus, I needed to stop at the pharmacy, and Yumi is finally taking some well-deserved time off. My overprotective twin is more saint than sister. She's been working her fingers to the bone while I've been. Well, the past year and a half have been brutal on me. I've had a fun mix of several bouts of bronchitis coupled with persistent pneumonia, but hopefully LA Community General is behind me. My endless hospital visits, medical bills, and seemingly eternal joblessness have been as hard on my sister as they have been on me, so when Yumi won an all-expenses-paid trip, I was her biggest cheerleader, urging her to go and enjoy herself for a change. I'm a big girl. I can take care of myself, I told her. But talk is cheap and it's time for me to walk the walk like I talk the talk. As each step takes me nearer our apartment building, I mull over my immediate goals. It's high time I found a steady job and helped Yumi out with the bills. If I can stay out of the hospital, maybe I can finally keep a job. After I pay off my medical bills, we'll be able to start saving up to eventually move away from this polluted urban jungle and relocate somewhere where my lungs won't feel like they're staging an all-out rebellion every time I inhale. Finally, I reach my building and swing open the glass door to the small, hot, cramped lobby and... What the hell? My heart sinks when I take in the new, out-of-order sign taped to the elevator doors. Unbelievable. I just used it an hour ago. The universe apparently has it out for me today. I curse aloud as I push open the door to the stairs. Five floors in the stifling heat feels like I'm standing at the bottom of Mount Everest, armed with loaded shopping bags, a pair of flip-flops and a sun hat. Just take it slow, I tell myself. In the back of my mind, I hear the voice of an emergency room physician telling me to avoid overexertion. I square my shoulders, take a deep breath, and start the arduous journey up the stuffy stairwell. Slowly. My lungs protest almost immediately, reminding me once again that they're not exactly fond of physical exertion. The air feels heavy. Oppressive. Like I'm in a smoke-filled room. Each gasp is shallower than the last. My chest tightens with every step I take. Panic surges through me as I recognize the all-too-familiar signs of an impending asthma attack. I stop on the landing and fumble through my bags for the new inhaler I just picked up from the pharmacy, then struggle to open my medication. Damn, why are these things wrapped in packaging you need a chainsaw to get through? My vision blurs. Little spots dance in front of my eyes and I have to grip the railing. My knuckles turn white as I try to steady my breath. Wheezing violently, I clutch my chest. 
it feels like needles are piercing my lungs and I drop to my knees. Tears mix with sweat, tracing a path down my cheeks as I struggle to inhale even a little oxygen. I think I hear a faint voice ask, hey, are you okay? A neighbor, maybe? But that might be my imagination. Darkness crowds the edges of my sight, and with a sense of grim inevitability, I feel myself losing consciousness. My body topples sideways a split second before everything around me fades to black. One moment I'm clinging to consciousness on the floor of my building's uncharmingly vintage, God only knows how many people have pissed and puked in its stairwell. The next, I find myself staring at a sterile hospital ceiling, which is becoming a familiar sight these days. I make a mental note to ask for a frequent visitor discount. Hey Sleeping Beauty! Groggily I turn my head to see Yumi stationed at my bedside like a vigilant sentry. Ah! Did they call you? You had to cut your vacation short. Frustrated tears burn the backs of my eyes. I'm so sorry. Nope. No, as in you didn't cut short your first getaway in forever, because your hapless and helpless sister ended up in the hospital again. I blink away the gathering tears before they can spill. I feel like such an anchor around her neck. No, as in I was headed home anyway. It's then that I notice my sister is practically vibrating with energy, and she has this light in her eyes that wasn't there before. Your time away from the city did you good. You look really happy. I am. She grins so wide I swear I can see all 32 of her teeth. I have great news. I met someone and I... I'm engaged. Silence fills the room as I blink at her, my mind scrambling to process. You got engaged during a 10-day vacation. I sit up with effort and press my hand to my pounding head. You're talking about marriage? Like the till death do us part thing. Yes, Kiko. She claps her hands together. Not only that, but he lives in a small mountain town with fresh clean air, and he wants us both to move in with him. I narrow my eyes in suspicion. Hold on, Yumi. Are you in love with this guy, or are you in love with the idea of getting me out of LA? Her eyes widen and she actually looks affronted but I don't stop. Tell me you really love this guy and genuinely want to marry him. His name is Lake and I'm madly in love with him Kiko. Wait until you see him. He's like a cross between a lumberjack and, and, Sheldon Cooper. Sheldon Cooper. I raise an eyebrow. From Big Bang Theory. He's nerdy as hell. She shrugs. But he's also got this ruggedly handsome vibe going on with arms that could chop wood all day long. I can't help but laugh. Oh Kiko, don't be a skeptic. I know it's a whirlwind romance, but this is the real thing. She insists, leaning in and squeezing my hand. I can't wait for you to see the adorable town we're moving to. I look into her eyes, searching for the truth. She certainly appears happy, and no one deserves happiness more than my sister. The last thing I want is to be her killjoy. Wouldn't it be better if I stayed here and... No. She flashes me a savage look. Her eyes are blazing and her lips are pressed together in a tight line. It makes me shrink a little. If you're not coming with me, then I'm not going. I'll call off the wedding. She crosses her arms over her chest to show me she means business. Then her shoulders droop. Please don't make me do that. Don't make me choose between true love and my sister. I'll always choose you. Well when she puts it that way. What's this town called, anyway? Mystic Hollow. Fresh air, beautiful scenery and no smog. Well let's see how soon I can get discharged so we can pack our bags for Mystic Hollow. Chapter 3 The nerve of that fucker thinking he can just waltz his rabid ass into our territory and kidnap a woman from right under our noses. Xandros is so incensed, his voice is several octaves lower than normal. His words emerge as more of a snarling animalistic growl than civilized human speech. I'm settled on the posh leather couch in Silas's testosterone-laden office. The assembled bear shifters, Hernan, Waylon, Xandros, me and even Silas, are collectively and quite literally growling. We're not only peeved to the high heavens about the recent kidnapping of Marla, one of the BFB bride candidates, but even more so about the shifter council's response. Fucking council, what are they thinking? The veins on Hernan's neck are popping. Thinking? You're assuming a lot, I chime in, sliding my glasses up the bridge of my nose. My statement earns me a couple of chuckles, and a disapproving scowl from Silas. Enough. Silas grunts from his alpha throne, aka the monstrous mahogany desk cluttered with paperwork. 
Waylon, usually full of levity and dad jokes, looks ready to sink his teeth and claws into some wolf flesh. How can they expect us to stand down? A kidnapping on our soil is a clear act of aggression. It's grounds for a declaration of war. A chorus of agreement rounds the room, accompanied by more growls and snarls. Xandros's brow is furrowed. Surely we can do something. It's our right to defend our territory and respond to threats, after all. Waylon snorts, his usual carefree voice ripe with bloodlust. They expect us to sit back scratching our scrotums after our territory was breached and a female under our protection was taken. Literally taken. I don't like it either. Silas growls. None of us do, but an order from the council is an order that we must and will uphold. Fucking wolves, Hernan snarls. Those fuckers need some vengeance to rain down on them, and I'm itching to be the guy to do it. I think we all feel the same way, but I repeat, we will follow the council's orders here. Silas directs his reprimand at Hernan, but it's clearly meant for us all. I suspect the council has information they've chosen not to share with us. We're still grumbling as the meeting adjourns, and we stand. Hernan corners me before we reach the door, nudging me with an elbow, sympathy in his eyes. No luck with the BFB program, huh, Lake? Tough break, man. My feet freeze and I turn to him. Actually, I did find a bride. You did? Hernan blinks, clearly shocked. Seriously? Xandros, Waylon, and Silas crowd around us too, pinning their curious gazes on me. Come on, spill, Waylon urges. He appears a little more excited than the others. Who's the lucky lady? Yumi Sumita, I announce, adjusting my glasses. Yumi. Silas echoes, his voice low and thoughtful. Yumi. The hairdresser. Hair stylist, I correct? Yes, the very same. She had to return to LA to tie up loose ends and pack up her apartment, but she'll be back today and she's bringing her sister with her. Her sister. Silas rubs his forehead as he digests the implications of having an unwed, unmated human female living in Mystic Hollow. How old is this sister? Hum. I hadn't asked. I don't know exactly, but Yumi takes care of her. They were apparently orphaned young and have no family, so they'll both be living with me post-nuptials. Takes care of her. Xandros questions. So she's a child? I don't know her age, I repeat. She has a medical condition, severe chronic asthma. Dr. Miriam assures me it can be disabling, and in extreme cases, fatal. The fresh air here will be worlds better for her than the air pollution in Los Angeles. And you're happy about all this, right? Hernan's face scrunches into a scowl. Because something about your expression. Of course I'm happy. I nod my head emphatically, then remember to stretch my lips in a smile, which I admit may appear a bit forced. I'm just contemplating the joys of wedded bliss. Bliss? With no love? Doubtful. Damn bear. Okay, maybe not bliss, but I can hope for wedded contentment. I put up with handshakes and backslaps of congratulations from each of the guys until I can't take any more and excuse myself. Being married to Yumi will be fine, I remind myself, as my bear once again tries to convince me I'm making a grave mistake. The moment I step outside, a rich aroma wafts into my nostrils. My knees almost buckle. A rush of blood flows to my groin. Need. Possess. Mate. Mine. The scent is teasing, tantalizing. It holds the promise of something far beyond mere contentment. It muddles my brain making it hard to think straight. A strange mixture of confusion and desire swirls inside me. I'm both intoxicated and aroused by the maddening combination of sweet, spicy, musky, and sultry. My bear is as crazed as I am. Need. Possess. Mate. Mine. Primal instinct takes over, and my feet are drawn down the street as though I'm being pulled by an irresistible force. Need. Possess. Mate. Mine. Chapter 4 Mama's Den is the town hub of good food and the seat of gossip here in Mystic Hollow. Yumi informs me as my eyes take in the local eatery. The diner is brimming with the chatter and clatter of patrons, and the distinct aroma of deep-fried goodness. Yumi walks us over to a table of four grinning women. Ladies, meet my sister Kiko. She drapes her arm around me. Kiko, meet Louise, Kate, Balin, and Alice, the bride tribe. The five of us are planning a group wedding. The group wedding comment is not a surprise to me. 
While we packed up our apartment in LA to make the move here, Yumi confessed that her paid vacation was actually a program she signed up for, a bit like a dating service. According to my sister, she and a group of single women came here for two weeks to meet a group of single men. At the end of that two weeks, many of the women departed still single, but Yumi and these four women are the lucky contestants who won husband prizes, if you can call marrying a man you've only known for less than a month a prize. Twins? Alice exclaims. Wow, Yumi, you didn't tell us you were a twin. Kiko, pull up a chair. Louise invites. Welcome to our first ever wedding planning meeting. I scan the group with curiosity. They seem relatively sane, so I can only assume it was desperation that led them into this predicament. I feel a twinge of guilt at that thought because I know my sister desperately wanted to get me out of the city, and I still suspect that might have something to do with her rushing into marriage. But who knows? Perhaps she did fall in love at first sight as she claims. By the way, I raise my hand. I hereby offer my services as a maid of honor. To any or all of you. Although I will include the disclaimer that I have absolutely no experience at the task. Sounds good. Kate responds jotting something down in her notebook. Has anyone thought about the flowers we'll be carrying? Alice speaks up, her voice soft but clearly excited. A good choice might be Rosa rubiginosa or Xantodesia ethiopica. Everyone turns confused eyes on Alice, who then appears flustered so I interpret. She's suggesting either red roses or calla lilies. A couple of the ladies chuckle. How about we entrust the task of selecting flowers to Alice since she's the expert, agreed? The nods and affirmative responses make the decision unanimous. Kate consults her notebook. Next on the agenda, food. Are we doing hors d'oeuvres and appetizers, or a full meal? And if it's a meal, will it be a buffet or a sit-down style? Everyone's gaze turns to Louise. I zone out a bit as the conversation continues, bouncing from flowers to food to wedding gowns to color schemes. When I do participate, it's only because I'm directly asked for my opinion. As the wedding plans unfold and free and easy laughter fills the air, I can't help but feel a sense of connection like this is where I belong. These women are all so nice and welcoming, and I'm becoming a part of something. A community. I like it. I haven't met Lake, my sister's future husband yet, but Yumi and I dropped our stuff off at the cabins where we'll be staying for the next few days, and from what I've seen of Mystic Hollow so far it has a quaint small town feel. Besides having an inherent charm, the air here is crystal clear and every breath I take is a little less of a struggle. As I lean back in my chair, Yumi flashes me one of her radiant, soul-warming smiles. I can't help but feel excited. Despite the unique circumstances, my sister is in love and getting married. It's everything I dreamed of for her. The only downfall so far is that she expects me to live with her and Lake after they're married. I haven't said anything yet, but I'm really hoping I can find myself a job and a place to live before then because three's a crowd, especially when two of the three are newly married. It's great to see you breathing easy, Kiko. Yumi leans in and keeps her voice as soft as a whisper. Who knows, maybe you'll catch one of the bridal bouquets. I imagine I'll snag all of them since I'll be the only single woman out there catching. The bell over the door jingles and something compels me to look over my shoulder. When I do, my body jolts like it's been zapped by a live wire. I sit up straighter and crane my neck harder as the most gorgeous man I've ever seen bursts through the door. He's seriously drool-worthy. Dressed in a t-shirt that stretches over his sculpted chest and biceps and jeans that hug his muscled thighs. My heart rate picks up speed. My mouth is suddenly dry. His hair is dark and tousled in a sexy devil-may-care way, and he's wearing dark-rimmed glasses. Wow, I breathe. I don't think I've ever been more grateful for the improved lung capacity. The man's eyes briefly flit to Yumi, then quickly take in the other women at our table. When his gaze falls on me, it lingers. Our eyes lock and it's like the first sip of hot chocolate on a cold winter day deliciously warm and delightfully tingly all the way down. His gaze remains on me as he walks straight over to our table. His cologne is like nothing I've ever smelled before, a delicious blend of pine, leather and old books that I feel deep in my core. Hey Lake. Join us. Louise gestures for him to pull up a chair. We're talking wedding plans. Lake. Lake. This is Lake. No way. No frickin' way. Lake darling. Yumi stands and gives him a quick hug but Lake's eyes are glued to me. I do my best to maintain a casual, I'm not ogling you expression, but oh boy, 
I'm feeling overheated all of a sudden. Lake, meet my twin sister Kiko. Yumi beams a smile my way. Kiko, he repeats, his voice as smooth as butter. I muster a casual smile while my mind sputters like a car on its last gallon of gas. Moisture leaks into my panties and my nipples bead. What is going on with me? The room suddenly feels stifling. Lake and I just stare at one another. There's an uncomfortably awkward silence while the others look away or fiddle with their napkins or cutlery. Finally, Lake reaches a hand out to me. My pleasure. Say, I clear my throat. Same. My voice comes out high-pitched and a little shaky. When I slide my hand into his, it's as though a wave of energy rolls through me zapping all my cells and making them dance. His hand rips mine and doesn't let go. Fine. Great. I don't want to let go either. There's some rustling and discreet coughs. Again, awkward. Internally, I'm having a war with a voice inside my head. Let go of his hand, Kiko. He's still holding mine, voice inside my head. Someone has to let go first. He's someone, why can't he? He's Yumi's fiancé. Oh crap. Yumi. My loyal, loving sister, who sacrificed so much for me. I yank my hand from his like it's searing my flesh. What's going on? Yumi glances at Lake then at me then back at Lake. With a start I realize I'm so incredibly attracted to Lake I'm practically drooling. Over my sister's fiancé. Nothing's going on. I. I need to go. I stand so abruptly my chair nearly topples over. Yumi, I'll see you back at the cabins. Then I race out of there like the place is filling with hot lava. Chapter 5 It's like my brain is short-circuiting. I stand gawking, far less smooth than I'd like. But in my defense she's incredible, all soft smiles and twinkling eyes that seem to pull me in like a tractor beam. And her scent. She smells like. Mine. That's when the realization hits me. Kiko is mine. Kiko is my fated mate. One moment I'm an intelligent bear who puts practicalities over primal instincts. The next I understand why my fellow shifters are acting all googly-eyed like lovesick cubs. One glance from Kiko, and I feel like I've just walked into a Jane Austen or an Emily Brawny novel. I'm dumbstruck when Kiko stands abruptly, muttering something about getting some fresh air and darts out of the diner. What? I know what I should do next. I should sit down, join the conversation, and pretend that I didn't just have my entire world appended by one tiny woman. But I don't. Nope, I do the stupidest thing I can do in this situation. I turn and chase after her, leaving Yumi and the other brides to be staring open-mouthed after me. Way to go, Lake. Kiko hasn't gone far. She's standing right outside the diner, pulling deep breaths into her lungs. I reach out, taking hold of her arm gently. Wait. Don't leave. I'm not really sure what to say to her or how to convince her to stay. I just want to be near her. We stand there, looking at each other. The silence between us is thick with an energy I can't quite put into words. It's like we're both magnets, helplessly drawn to each other. Kiko finally breaks the silence. Why did you follow me? Ah, the million dollar question. I? Um. I just wanted to make sure you were okay, I stammer, suddenly feeling like a schoolboy caught passing love notes in class. You ran out so suddenly, I thought maybe I'd scared you off or something. You're my sister's fiancé, she states emphatically. You should be inside. With her? It's a fact that hangs heavily in the air between us. I desperately want to confess, to tell her the engagement is a farce, an arrangement for her benefit, but I can't. I promised you me. I swore an oath of secrecy. But then Kiko being my fated mate wasn't part of the equation back then either. Well, technically, yes, I'm her fiancé, I reply, scratching the back of my neck and trying to figure a way around my promise. But in my defense, I didn't know you existed when I agreed to marry her. It's not until Kiko scowls and folds her arms in front of her that I realize how that must have sounded. I didn't mean it like that. I meant... I release a slow, audible exhale and shift on my feet. Somehow, I need to find a way to navigate this situation delicately. I'm still contemplating how to explain that I may be engaged to her sister but I'm actually drawn to her without sounding like a total creep when Yumi bursts out of Mama's den. She's got a sisterly protective stance going on and I brace for impact. 
What do you think you're doing to my sister? Me? Nothing. You made her uncomfortable. Yumi points an accusatory finger my way. I blink, not sure how to respond. Kiko jumps in attempting to soothe her sister. No, Yumi. He didn't do anything. He just came to see if I was okay. He's very kind and considerate. I can see why you fell in love with him. I wince when she says that. Yumi's eyes soften for a moment as she looks at her sister. Then why did you run out like that? I feel a headache coming on. Kiko backs up a few steps as she speaks. A big one. A few more steps. Like migraine level. She keeps backing away as she talks. I want to lie down. I'll see you back at the cabins later. Kiko can't seem to get away from us fast enough. She shoots me one more glance before she takes off almost in a sprint leaving me to Yumi's wrath. Sure enough, Yumi whips back around to me, her eyes spitting fire. You promised you'd accept her, make her feel welcome. You gave me your word. I don't know how to respond so I adopt a clueless shrug defense. I didn't mean to. Yumi's gaze hardens. She crosses her arms, glaring at me. Lake, this is serious. You have to play your part. That was our deal. You're right. I rub the back of my neck, feeling the weight of that deal like a boulder. I did give my word. The deal. A transactional marriage. Yumi's eyes soften. Just remember, Lake, this could save her life. Save her life, I repeat, but the words feel like ashes in my mouth. My sister has been here for less than a day, and already she has more color in her face, and her breathing has vastly improved. I sigh, running a hand through my hair. Good. That's good. My mind is still reeling when Yumi turns and heads back into the diner, leaving me standing there, trapped in what feels like a Shakespearean tragedy. Chapter 6 My befuddled brain has wrestled with thoughts of my sister's fiancé, a man I just met, all last night and all this morning. I feel like I'm losing my mind. So naturally, I do what I always do when life gets crazy and I need to find my center. I go to the library. When I was a foster kid with little money and few resources, the public library was my place. My sanctuary. To this day the smell of books, the hushed whispers, and the organized shelves are as soothing to me as a warm blanket on a chilly evening. Looking for anything specific? I spin to find the librarian flashing a dazzlingly huge smile. A male librarian to be precise. Not that his gender particularly matters. It's just that he's, well, ridiculously good-looking. Just browsing thanks. You're new around here. Is it my imagination or is he flexing his muscles? My sister explained that there was a lack of single females in Mystic Hollow, but for some reason it didn't register until now that that might make me a hot commodity. An astute observation, I tease. I've never been much of a flirt but a girl can learn, right? Well, I'm Otto, and I'm at your disposal. Otto has the kind of lethal looks that would melt most women's hearts like butter in a microwave. Unfortunately, I'm hung up on a man who is completely off-limits to me. Thank you, Otto, but I'm pretty savvy when it comes to navigating a library. His smile falls slightly before perking back up again. Maybe we can change the setting then. Would you have dinner with me sometime? He leans forward ever so slightly, his eyes hopeful. A date? His proposal catches me off guard. A small smile plays on my lips as I contemplate the offer. A date. Hum. Maybe that's what I need. Otto is handsome and he's a librarian, but for some reason I feel zero attraction to him. On the other hand, he could be a solid dependable distraction to take my mind off a certain someone I should not be thinking about. And dinner sounds harmless enough. Maybe. I finally answer, my eyes drawn back to the rows of books. I need some time to think about it. My reply earns a please nod. Otto is forward but not pushy, and after our exchange, he leaves me alone to delve into the labyrinth of books. I get lost in the shelves for I don't know how long. I always lose track of time when I'm perusing a library. I'm skimming the shelves of the fantasy section when I detect a certain aroma, a familiar smell that has my heart doing an Irish jig. Pine, leather, and old books. It's my new favorite scent. And then I remember who it belongs to. I stifle a gasp, clutch a random book to my chest, throw myself into the nearest chair and with my pulse pounding in my ears pretend to be engrossed. Hello. 
I look up and like an Oscar-winning actress, I put on my best I'm so surprised to see you here expression. I don't think he's fooled. Lake towers over the table where I'm seated, his hands tucked in his pockets looking hot enough to pose for an intellectual hottie's calendar. If there is such a thing. Is there? Sounds promising. Maybe I should Google that. His eyes look almost as if they're glowing. Unlike my reaction to Otto, my stupid body is all about this man. My cheeks heat, my nipples harden and my breathing grows rapid. Why does the one man who makes my pulse race have to be my sister's fiancé? Are you stalking me? I ask, trying to keep my voice light. It's a joke but there's a tremble in my words. Not because I'm scared but because my heart's still doing that funky jig. Lake lets out a chuckle, a deep rumbling sound that should probably be studied by scientists for its erotic properties. Not at all. He shifts his weight from one foot to another, looking a bit like a kid with his hand in the cookie jar. I'm an avid reader. The public library is my second favorite place, right after my personal library. Personal library. I feel my eyebrows hike up my forehead. He nods. I have an extensive collection of tomes at home. Oh, this man is perfect. An entire library in your home? Are you saying you're wealthy? I joke, trying to push away the nervousness bubbling inside. He grins. I have a wealth of books if that counts. He slides his glasses up his nose, his deep blue eyes sparkling with intelligent humor. His hand reaches out and he runs a finger down the well-worn spine of the book in my hands. Not all those who wander are lost, he says, and it dawns on me that he's just verbalized a direct quote from the book I'm holding, The Fellowship of the Ring. I raise a brow feeling a grin tug at my lips. You've read it? Of course. Tolkien is arguably the founding father of fantasy. We're both smiling as Lake pulls out a chair and sits down next to me. My heart flutters. Yes, this man is sheer perfection. Chapter 7 Do you read genres other than fantasy? I read anything I can get my hands on. Romance? I tease. Some men wouldn't be caught dead admitting they read romance. Those men are not my type. Not at all. Some. Absolutely. He leans back in his chair looking relaxed. Austin is basically the queen of drawing room battles. The level of verbal sparring and pride and prejudice? It's like watching a dramatic 18th century dance-off. Lake grins stroking his chin in mock contemplation. Actually, it'd be interesting to see Elizabeth Bennet and Frodo Baggins as dual protagonists. Now there is a cross-genre retelling I'd pay to read. Elizabeth would have Sauron wrapped around her little finger in no time. The corners of his eyes crinkle adorably when he smiles. I wonder what she'd make of Gollum. I wink, testing out my flirting skills. Maybe set him up with Mr. Collins. Lake grins then leans closer, his voice a conspiratorial whisper. That's evil. Brilliantly Austin-esquely evil. I bark a genuine hearty laugh causing a few heads in the library to turn our way and my cheeks to heat with embarrassment. Oops. Got a little carried away there. But it doesn't diminish the warm, deep-down glow I feel. It's like we're two lone souls in the universe speaking a language only we understand. Lake slides his chair closer. It's refreshing to meet someone who shares my enthusiasm for literature. Yes, it is. I nod. My love for literature borders on addiction necessary and all-consuming. I'm kind of a closet writer as well. I don't just read stories, I create them. What? Why did I tell him that? I don't tell anyone about my writing habit. Not even Yumi knows. I suddenly feel an odd mix of vulnerability and excitement having admitted that. Lake's eyes widen. Really? I'd love to hear more. It's not much, I say, suddenly feeling a bit shy. My asthma has made it difficult to hold down a job for any significant length of time. So I spent a lot of time at home and in the hospital. Books were my escape. And writing. Well, it gave me a voice. Lake's eyes shine with genuine interest and admiration, maybe. Or maybe I'm reading too much into an expression. That's incredible. Okay, this time it's not my imagination. There's awe in his voice. I would love to read anything you care to share. What do you write about? Well, color me Fifty Shades of Flustered. Lake wants to read my stories. 
I turned to face him, basking in our strong connection. Oh, adventures, love, the usual. But mostly, stories where the heroines don't need to be rescued. They do the saving. Lake's laugh lines deepen as his lips curve into a beautiful smile. His eyes glow like sparkling diamonds that bore into my soul. You are fantastic. Utterly fantastic. Before I even realize what's happening, his face is inches from mine. His enticing aroma washes over me, and it's like my brain takes a hike and my libido grabs the wheel. Then his lips are on mine and the world around us blurs. Something nags at the back of my brain, something I'm trying to listen to, but darn it, I'm so lost in the moment that nothing else registers. It's crazy how one second we're discussing a Middle Earth and Regency-era England mashup, and the next our tongues are tangling in a world-shattering kiss. My heart must be auditioning for a drum solo in a rock band because it beats so loud, I swear the whole library can hear it. The kiss is as spellbinding as our conversation was. It's full of passion and promise and in spoken words. We're in our very own romance novel. The split second of pleasure ends when my brain finally kicks in, and reality whacks me upside the head with the force of a ten-ton bulldozer. I push him away. Oh my god, Lake. My voice trembles, the weight of my betrayal sinking in my stomach like a rock. That was... Great, wonderful, amazing. No. My heart hammers like a jackrabbit on energy drinks. That was horrific. I mean terrific. I mean no, I definitely mean horrific. What am I even saying? You. You're Yumi's. I can't believe I. Tears fill my eyes. I'm sorry, Kiko. His voice is husky and his eyes display a muddled mess of emotions. He scratches the back of his neck and looks down. I shouldn't have kissed you. You think? I snap, then immediately regret it. I mean you should go. A series of expressions flicker across Lake's face from surprise to regret to something more complex I can't quite decipher. Kiko, there's something I need to. But I don't let him finish. Leave, I blurt out. Not my finest moment but guilty panic is a bitch. Just. Just go. Reluctance darkens his gaze. I mean it, Lake. My breathing grows labored and I dig in my pocket, pull out my inhaler, and take a puff. Surprisingly, it's the first time I've used it since we arrived in Mystic Hollow. Please stay calm. Looking worried, he rises from his chair. I'm leaving. And? I'm sorry. He hesitates for another moment until my breathing normalizes, then with his head hung, I watch Lake walk across the library and out the front door. My heart drops a little with each step he takes away from me. I'm not sure how long I sit there staring into space. Maybe a minute. Maybe five minutes. Maybe twenty, before Otto approaches. Still good? Great, I lie, my voice wavering. The taste of Lake's kiss is still on my lips, and the guilt on my conscience threatens to swallow me whole. Hey Otto, I say, my voice cracking slightly. About that dinner offer. Chapter 8 Kate and Silas are hunched over a table in Mystic Hollow's bustling community center, meticulously diagramming seating arrangements with the precision of military strategists. Balin and Zandros are seated across from them perusing pictures of wedding gowns on a laptop, and Louise and Hernan are passing out samples of wedding cake. My eyes are on Alice as she chats animatedly to Waylon, debating the merits of peonies versus hydrangeas with such intensity, you'd think she was discussing nuclear physics. I don't think he has a clue what she's talking about, but his wide smile is genuine as he hangs on her every word. A sense of clarity washes over me. Alice is vibrant, intelligent, a remarkable chess partner, and an undeniably fascinating person. A few days ago, I thought I was in love with her. I know better now. That fierce passion I once thought I felt for her. It's more like the soft glow of a flickering candle, compared to the blazing bonfire that I feel for Kiko. Kiko makes me feel as though my entire being has awakened to a world I never knew existed. A world filled with emotion, longing, and a bond that goes beyond mere friendship or intellectual compatibility. Every time the woman looks at me, I know she's my other half. I feel it deep in my gut. I watch as Alice playfully swats at Waylon, and I have to admit fate knew what she was doing there, even if they are an opposites attract match. Yumi stands gazing over Balin's shoulder like a statue. A calm composed perfectly carved statue. It's time to rip off the band-aid. I sidle up to her. Yumi, we need to talk. 
She lets me take her arm and usher her away from the wedding madness. What is it, Lake? I really think we need to tell Kiko the truth about us. I can hear my voice tinged with urgency. Yumi's eyes scan over the room, checking that the brides and grooms are all occupied. Her face tightens, and she crosses her arms over her chest, an unyielding impenetrable wall. Lake, we've been through this. She can't know. It's too much of a risk. I huff out a breath, struggling to find the right words. Yumi, it's about being honest. That's all I'm asking, honesty. Even as I say it, I realize I'm not being entirely honest with Yumi. But to be fair, what can I say? I'm in love with your sister and I want to make a life with her. That ought to go over like a lead balloon. Yumi shoots me a look that could curdle milk. Lake, my priority is to protect my sister. If she knew the truth, she'd never let me go through with it. Furthermore, she'd drag me out of Mystic Hollow so fast, all you'd see is the cloud of dust we leave in our wake. I can't help but wince at her words, knowing how tangled this web has become. I run a hand through my hair, exasperated. Don't you think it's unfair to her? And to us? I gesture vaguely between the two of us. She tilts her head and crosses her arms. Kiko's fragile lake. Her asthma has almost killed her more than once. This town is her chance at a better life, and I won't take that away from her. I sigh, feeling like I'm wrestling with a bear and losing. Which is, in this town, quite a literal possibility. You me, it's a lie. And every time I look into Kiko's eyes, I feel guilty. She softens slightly, placing a hand on my arm. Please. Her eyes hold so much pleading, I have to swallow down a lump in my throat. Then she presses her palms together in front of her in a prayer pose. If you care about either of us at all, keep your mouth shut. I'm begging you. It's just that. Listen. Listen to what I have to say, and if you still think it's the right move to tell Kiko, I might consider it. That sounds fair enough, so I nod. Yumi's eyes shine with unshed tears. When we were born, I came out first. I was healthy and weighed in at almost seven pounds, but Kiko was just under four pounds and blue. My jaw clenches, and Yumi continues. Her tiny lungs were not quite up to task, and even with the oxygen tents and ventilators, no one thought she'd make it. But she did. Somehow she pulled through. Kiko's always been a fighter, even with the odds stacked against her. Yumi's voice is barely above a whisper. And her battle was just beginning. Asthma attacks peppered our childhood, more common than birthday parties or playdates. Foster care didn't exactly provide private clinic access or visits to top specialists, either. Sometimes our foster families wouldn't even bother to get her to the hospital until she passed out cold. Yumi paints a picture of resilience, two little girls against the world, one constantly fighting for every breath she took. The other, her fierce protector. It's heartbreaking. And it's Kiko's reality. I understand why Yumi would do anything to protect her sister, even if it means committing to a loveless marriage. When we got older and aged out of the system, emergency room visits and hospital stays were followed by months of ramen dinners and secondhand clothes patched up past their prime. We wanted to get out of LA, but there was never enough money. There were always stacks of overdue medical bills, and we were always behind on the rent. Fortunately, we had maybe the only landlord in the city who let us fall a couple months behind and didn't evict us. The pollution, the smog, it's so bad for her lungs. The look in Yumi's eyes is like a direct kick to the groin. Damn. How do you argue with that? Lake, I proposed marriage because it's the only way I could figure to get her out of LA. We don't have the money to live here on our own. I'll give you. No. I know my sister. The last thing she wants is to feel like a charity case. There's no way she'd accept money from you or let me accept it. If she found out, she'd drag me back to LA so fast we'd leave skid marks on the road. I won't risk that. I exhale a long breath, the kind that feels like you're letting go of more than just air. The kind that feels like surrender. Okay. The word barely makes it out of my lips. We keep it a secret. For Kiko's sake, for her health and well-being, I'll bury the truth, silence my own desires. Maybe this is what it really means to love someone, putting their needs above your own, even if it tears you apart. Yumi gives me a reassuring pat. It's for the best, Lake. Chapter 9 Try the tuna salad. Otto reaches into the wicker basket and pulls out a styrofoam container with a variety of finger sandwiches. Did you make all these, Otto? He looks a little sheepish. 
No, I paid Lou at Mama's Den to make me up a spread. Otto has brought me to a breathtaking spot where he's laid out a picnic spread, and I can't help but appreciate the effort. If only my mind would stop wandering off like a rebellious teenager. It's been two days. 48 hours. 2,880 minutes. That's how long I've avoided Lake, not that I'm counting or anything. Yet, I can't seem to erase him from my mind for more than a minute. He seems to have planted his flag in every corner of my brain, and it's harder than my high school calculus class to get him out. I bite into the tuna sandwich triangle, my taste buds rejoicing at the delightful mix of flavors. Otto displays a dazzling smile as I hum in appreciation. The sun catches in his blonde hair, and for a split second I think maybe he and I. No. In theory, Otto is everything I could ask for in a guy. He's handsome, intelligent, and able to converse for hours about my favorite subject, books. But there's just one problem. Lake. Otto sits up and slides his arm around me, his gaze penetrating. My heart should be thumping in my chest, right? That's the usual reaction when a good-looking guy shows interest. But instead, it feels more like my heart is shrugging out a mediocre little meh. Kiko, what do you think of Mystic Hollow? I force a smile and try not to flinch, mentally slapping myself for letting my mind drift back to Lake again. You're on a date with a handsome man. Stop thinking about someone who is off limits to you. It's beautiful, Otto. So different from LA. The air's cleaner, the pace of life is slower and somehow gentler. And the people are friendlier. Otto nods, and I can see he's genuinely trying to make this a good date. And so am I. Truly I am. But it's like trying to watch a movie while wearing earbuds that are streaming an entirely different movie. Suddenly, I sense something shift in the air. It's like the charge before a storm, or when you get that weird feeling that someone's watching you but you don't see anyone. The hair on the back of my neck stands on end, and a low menacing growl rips through the silence making me jump. My eyes grow wide, and my heartbeat picks up pace until it pounds in my chest like it's trying to shatter my ribcage. Not because of Otto. No, it's all because of the towering figure that's just emerged from the shadows, his eyes burning with a wild feral rage. Lake. His gaze is savage as it swings from Otto to me and I can't look away. Jealousy. The realization hits me like a tidal wave. He's jealous. Of Otto being with me. I don't know how I know that but I'm certain of it. The thought makes my heart do a funny little shimmy, and a thrill of excitement ripples through me. Rage rolls off Lake in palpable waves, radiating in Otto's direction. It takes Otto only a second before he's on his feet, standing in a semi-crouch in front of me and blocking me protectively. Thanks Otto but it's not me he's going to hurt. Then in a blink and you'd miss it moment, Lake changes. And by changes I mean he morphs from an angry man into an angry grizzly bear, huge hairy and very very pissed off. I have to admit, there's something to be said about witnessing your first man-to-bear transformation. Sure I've seen strange things. I've lived my entire life in LA, but Lake sprouting fur and claws? That's something I never could have anticipated. I'm very well read, and I've devoured enough paranormal romance books to know what I'm watching. Lake is a shifter, a bear shifter. Instinctively, I know he won't hurt me. Otto on the other hand, if he has any sense, will bolt right now. He doesn't. No, Otto transforms into a bear too, and suddenly I'm caught in the middle of some National Geographic special. And not the fun learning about cute penguins kind of special. Nope. The fierce angry grizzly special. Otto's bear is slightly lighter in color, and I think maybe the tuna has gone bad and I'm having a reaction because this can't be real. I'm suffering an extreme hallucinatory effect. Bear Lake is the epitome of unleashed raw power, and Bear Otto isn't far behind. They run at each other and collide like two forces of nature, their growls echoing through the trees. It's a full-on grizzly bear brawl. The spectacle unfolds before me, a clash of titans, a battle that would put any professional wrestling match to shame. Every swipe of their massive paws sends sprays of dirt and twigs, like nature's confetti marking this brutal occasion. The ground seems to shake with their combined fury. Their roars echo around me, each one a testament of power and might. Fur flies as they swipe at each other, massive paws striking with thunderous blows. I'm awestruck by the spectacle of primal power and aggression. These two massive creatures are fighting tooth and claw only feet from me, but for some very bizarre reason I'm not scared. Not at all. Maybe it's the bad tuna. Lake lunges, Otto dodges. 
Otto swipes Lake Perry's. It's a dance. A terrifying beautiful dance, and I'm entranced, wondering how many times I'll have to pinch myself before I wake up. But there's no waking up from this. Lake lands a decisive blow, and just as Lake gains the upper paw, I suddenly can't breathe. I wheeze clutching my chest. Usually I know when an asthma attack is coming, but in this case I've been so mesmerized by the fight it caught me off guard. As I struggle for a raspy gasping breath, Otto takes off, running into the woods like a bear with its tail between its legs. Literally. In the blink of an eye, Bear Lake morphs back into Man Lake. The fur disappears, the claws shrink, and there he stands, wide-eyed and sweaty and looking far too attractive for someone who's just gone from man to beast and back again. He rushes to my side. Hey, hey, Kiko. It's okay. I look into Lake's eyes, then realize he's clutching my inhaler, which he must have fetched from my bag, a testament to his keen observation. I take the inhaler from him and press it to my lips, the medicine easing the tightness in my chest. Slowly, I start to breathe easier. Thanks, I manage to say between puffs, my heart slowly calming down as my breaths grow less labored. I'm still a little oxygen deprived. Not all of it is from the asthma attack. Lake's steady gaze softens. Feeling better? That was. Um. Quite the party trick. I gesture vaguely at his body. Quite the party trick. It's then that I noticed he's stark naked and seemingly unbothered by that fact. His abs, biceps, everything's on display, like he's a walking advertisement for an all-natural gym. I try to focus anywhere but his well. Everywhere. Lake grins that adorable lopsided grin of his and shrugs. Usually, I have more control over my shifting, but today was. Unique. Unique indeed, I mumble, my traitorous gaze straying to his. Uniqueness. Chapter 10 If I had a bucket list, that would definitely have been on it, Kiko says. Her breathing is better now, but I'm still a little worried about her. A bucket list? I casually scoop up the picnic remains, dump them into a wicker basket, then take Kiko's hand to help her up. She blinks, clearly confused by my question. Yeah, you know, things a person wants to accomplish before they die. Like skydiving, seeing the northern lights, that kind of thing. You want to skydive? I shake the crumbs off of the red and white checkered tablecloth that had been spread on the ground and wrap it around my waist in a makeshift sarong. No, and I don't have a bucket list either. I'm just saying that seeing a man turn into a grizzly bear is something out of this world. Seeing two men turn into bears and then witnessing them fight each other is... Wow. Oh, where do you think Otto is anyway? Do you think he was hurt? I'd be jealous that she's asking about Otto if it hadn't taken until now for her to even remember he had been her dinner companion. The thought still makes my blood boil. I wave my hand in the air. He's fine. My ferocity scared him off like a frightened cub. Not really. Otto and I are pretty evenly matched. In truth he got the picture that Kiko was mine, my fated mate, and that I was willing to fight to the death for her, so he forfeited the brawl and took off. Kiko's expression oscillates between amusement and shock. It's truly remarkable how well she's dealing with what just went down. You probably have questions about what you just saw. I don't even know where to start. She manages a shaky laugh. You're both bear shifters, right? Is anyone else in the town a bear shifter? Does Yumi know? There it is. The Yumi question. I nod. Everyone in Mystic Hollow, except for the brides from BFB and you, are bear shifters. Yes, Yumi knows. I rub my forehead. Kiko, I start, struggling for the right words. Yumi's. Well, she's. I mean what she and I have. It's not exactly a head-over-heels kind of thing. I don't want to betray Yumi's trust, but Kiko needs to know that if she has feelings for me, she's not stepping on the toes of her sister's future happiness. My gaze meets hers and holds. I mentally will her to read between the lines of what I just said. Kiko's confusion morphs into a look of consideration, then uncertainty. So why are you marrying her? I chuckle and scrub a hand over my face. Then sensing I'm getting too close to crossing the line and breaking my promise to Yumi, I change the subject. How about we get out of here? Let me take you somewhere. Her jaw drops. I am not going on a date with you, you're my soon-to-be brother-in-law. I hold up a hand. Not a date. There's something I'd like to show you. Her head tilts, considering. Okay, I guess. 
Where is this something? My house. She looks wary. That doesn't sound like a good idea. Oh, come on. I place a hand on her lower back to lead her, but she doesn't budge, and I don't want to push her. It's going to be yours and Yumi's house too very soon. Say yes. You won't regret it. I promise. A silent standoff ensues. Her eyes study my face as if she's assessing the risk reward ratio of hanging out with me at my place. I can see the war waging in her eyes, curiosity against caution, heart against mind. All right, she finally says, still harboring a slightly wary glint in her eyes. It's not a long walk to my place, but I feel like an idiot dressed in a red and white checkered tablecloth, so rather than walk through town, I lead Kiko on a back route through the woods. I can't help but continually glance over at her. I sense she's intrigued by me but also guarded, scared of hurting her sister. If only I could win her over, and make her fall in love with me, without stepping out of the soon-to-be brother-in-law role. Yumi's right. I can't risk Kiko's health. I can't risk her running back to Smog City. Here we are, I say, as I swing open the door to my house. Kiko's reaction as we step inside strokes my ego. Wow, she exclaims. Rustic charm meets lumberjack chic. Her eyes are the size of saucers as she stares in wonderment. Her gaze travels across the open concept living space with its exposed wooden beams, cozy stone fireplace, and oversized furniture, then to the wall of windows displaying the breathtaking mountain view. Nature has a habit of showing off here in Mystic Hollow, and it often feels like I'm living in a Bob Ross painting, happy little trees and all. It's stunning, Lake. Now for what I brought you here to show you. With a mischievous grin tugging at the corners of my mouth, I lead her to the double doors at the end of the main hallway. Brace yourself for the pièce de résistance. You thought the mountain view was something? Wait till you see this. I push open the doors to reveal my sanctuary, my fortress of solitude, solitude that I will gladly and willingly share with her. My library. It's a two-story bastion of literature that, as far as I'm concerned, is the heart of this home. I watch as her eyes nearly pop out of her skull, and I can't help but chuckle. Do you like it? Like it. Kiko whirls around to face me, her hands gesturing wildly at the room. Her eyes rove over the towering mahogany shelves, filled to the brim with well-loved books, and the spiral staircase leading to a second level of literary goodness. She dashes over to a reading nook bathed in sunlight, piled with cushions in various shades of blue. I can see her wheels turning. She's imagining herself reading here, getting lost in a good book. Blake, this is the library from Beauty and the Beast. I feel like Belle and you're... Ah. When she realizes what she was just about to say, she bites her lip, but I burst out laughing. Her cheeks grow pink, but her enthusiasm remains. This is seriously like a literary amusement park. Do you think Belle would be jealous? I ask, leaning against the doorway, a smug grin playing on my lips. I think Belle would be packing her bags and moving in. She retorts, dancing around the room, touching everything. We spend the next hour or so chatting about our favorite authors, the merits of hardcover over paperback, and the scent of old books versus new. It's easy, comfortable, and she's so excited she's giddy. I can't wait until she moves in here. In a lull of our conversation, I decide to bring up the topic that's been gnawing at my mind. Casually as I can, I lean back against one of the bookcases and glance over at her. So Kiko, hypothetically speaking, if for some reason you, me and I decided not to marry, what would you do? The question catches her off guard and she looks at me, her eyes narrowing slightly. I'd probably be on the first plane, train or bus back to LA, she replies, a hint of suspicion in her voice. I arch an eyebrow at her, attempting to keep my face as neutral as possible. Oh? You wouldn't stay? No, she says immediately, and then looks away as if she's rethinking her answer. No, I wouldn't stay. I see, I mumble, as my heart sinks to my toes. Chapter 11 The hall is abuzz with activity. Here in a back room that's serving as a dressing room, multiple brides flutter about in a flurry of chiffon and lace and sparkling hand-beaded bodices. The scent of champagne is in the air and I'm so tense I could snap like a twig. There are nervous giggles, clinking glasses and twirls in front of mirrors. Me. I'm smack dab in the middle, zipping my sister into her white cloud of happily ever after. Breathe Kiko, Yumi instructs, her words are muffled as I hoist up layers of her dress to slip her satin shoes on her feet. Funny, she's about to walk down the aisle and marry the love of her life, yet she's the one telling me to breathe. 
Almost there, Cinderella. As I finish with her shoes and sit back on my heels so she can stand, I hate myself for the twinge of jealousy that threatens to creep up. Not about the dress or the wedding. About the man she's about to marry. Lake's question from the other day continually haunts me. What would I do if he broke it off with Yumi? I find myself brushing my thumb against my lips, as the bittersweet memory of the kiss we shared in the library enters my mind. What the long face, Kiko? Today's supposed to be the happiest day of my life. Yumi winks, but her smile fades as she takes in my expression. Right, happiest day. I force a laugh, my gut twisting. I think I need a quick breather. I excuse myself, step outside the room, and lean against the cool cinder block of the corridor, thinking of Lake and Yumi, soon to be joined as husband and wife. Why can't I get rid of the nagging what ifs? What if Lake had broken it off? What would have happened? At the mere thought, a massive mountain of guilt wells up inside me. It would have been terrible. Awful. My sister's in love with him. My wonderful sister, who's been there for me through thick and thin, who stood by my side through every asthma attack and supported me despite the financial toll it's taken on her. I will never betray her. Never. Sure she and Lake were a whirlwind romance but that doesn't mean it's not real or that it won't last. Maybe after the wedding I should leave town. Yes. That's probably wise. I'll leave town. Definitely. As I rejoin the room, I see Yumi standing in front of a full-length mirror in a beautiful wedding gown, admiring her reflection. She's gorgeous. So what do you think? Yumi twirls and the skirt of her dress flares out around her. You really do look like a Disney princess. I attempt to keep my mood and expression light but my heart feels like lead. You are stunning. She beams, radiating happiness. Thank you sis. Somewhere behind me, Balin pops open another bottle of champagne and pours a little for each of us. One last toast to take the edge off, she says. I accept a glass. Here's hoping the ceremony goes off without a hitch. Lou toasts, her voice bubbly with excitement or maybe just tipsy from the alcohol. The other women respond with a collective cheers. I take a sip of the champagne, wishing that my heart came with a mute button. Kate nudges my arm. Are you ready to be this year's number one maid of honor? Oh, definitely. I plaster on a fake smile as the first notes of the wedding march begin to play through the sound system. We line up at the door with me, the sole bridesmaid for all five women in the lead. You can do this, Kiko. Just get through the wedding today. Tomorrow, you can run back to L.A. Of course, as the doors swing open, the first thing my eyes land on is Lake. Dressed in a tuxedo and standing at the altar with the other grooms, he looks every bit like the man of my dreams. The man of my dreams who is about to marry my twin. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. My brain drifts off as the officiant's words wash over me, a steady stream of promises and commitments that I can't bring myself to fully digest. Kiko looks like an angel. A beautiful, celestial vision. She's so lovely I can't even bear to look over at her. Speaking of bears, mine is untamed and wild today. So riled beneath my skin, I have to fight not to sprout fur during my own wedding. Holy shit, my wedding. What the fuck am I doing? How can I marry Yumi? My eyes glance over at her. Her face is like stone. I feel like I'm caught in the middle of some bizarre, surreal, alternate reality. A grand spectacle of a quickly thrown together group wedding, with both my bear and my heart about to stage protests and go rogue. I can't do it. I can't. I just can't. Then it happens. That part of a wedding ceremony that they show in all those rom com movies, where the preacher dramatically asks if anyone has any objections. Seriously, is there a single romantic comedy out there where this moment goes smoothly? Almost without thinking, my mouth opens and the words tumble out, I object. After a few shocked gasps, the place goes completely silent. Yumi's gaze pierces me, a mix of disbelief and fury. I turn my eyes to Kiko standing only a few feet away looking devastated. She looks completely shattered. My heart clenches at the sight of her expression and I want nothing more than to comfort her, but I have to clear things up with Yumi first. Yumi, I managed to say, my voice sounding surprisingly steady despite the chaos in my head. Can we talk? In private. Kiko makes a sound something between a gasp a wail and a keening cry before tears well in her eyes and she turns and runs. I want to run after her. 
Every fiber of my being is screaming at me to go after her, to hold her, and to tell her that I'm sorry for all of this. But I can't do that. Not yet. The air crackles with tension as Yumi's eyes narrow, and I can practically see the steam shooting out of her ears. She's not the type to make a public scene, so she nods curtly, and we step away from the altar, the eyes of all present, practically the entire town follow our every move. Seriously, Lake? Yumi hisses through gritted teeth, once we're a bit farther from the crowd. I can't do it, Yumi, I admit. My voice is low and tinged with desperation. I can't marry you. Chapter 12 The town looks hauntingly quiet, eerily deserted as I make my frenzied retreat from the grand chaos of the wedding venue. The streets, usually alive with people and chatter, are a ghost town today because everyone's attending the group wedding. So it's me, a mountain of remorse and Mystic Hollow's echoing silence. This time the heavy, sinking feeling in my chest is not an asthma attack. It's my own guilty conscience. I swing open the door to my cabin. It's cozy with just the right amount of rustic charm. Perfect for wallowing, and right now that's precisely my agenda. After my wallowing stint, I'll be packing my things and returning to Los Angeles. Before I can even kick off my shoes and plunge into a marathon of self-recrimination, there's a knock on my door. Swinging it open, I met with a pair of intense regret-filled eyes. Lake. And of course my asshole heart skips a beat. Or two. Lake lifts his hands like he's trying to ward off any oncoming attacks. As if that will work. Kiko, before you say anything, just... What? Did you... do? It's a rhetorical question. The fact that he's here at my cabin, rather than back at the hall marrying my sister is answer enough. I glare at him. How could you? Lake like a gentle giant pushes forward, holding my shoulders. Look, I get how this looks. But Kiko, nothing was done out of malice. My snort is far from ladylike. I throw up my hands in exasperation. Oh great. So it's okay you broke my sister's heart because it wasn't done with malicious intent? His thumb traces circles on my shoulder, sending shivers down my spine. I should pull away. I should. But? Ah. Uh, my body is so not playing on team rational thought right now. Listen Kiko. All I'm asking is for you to hear me out. Just hear me out. Give me a chance to explain. Fine. Talk. You have ten seconds, I snap, channeling my inner diva, arms crossed. Lake steps inside, his broad frame immediately making the space feel cozier. Or maybe more claustrophobic. I haven't decided yet. Nine seconds to go, I challenge. Yumi's heart is far from broken. She doesn't love me any more than I love her. His eyes heat. The only woman I love is you. Oh my god. This is a nightmare. What have I done? What have you done? I can't breathe, and I fumble around in my tiny clutch for the inhaler I stuffed in there this morning. But surprisingly by the time I pull it out my breathing has normalized. You good? Lake's brow is creased in concern. I nod. So. He starts again his voice soft and tender. As I was saying, you, me, and I had an arrangement. I raise an eyebrow, a sassy retort at the ready. Oh? What type of arrangement? He chuckles. The sound warm but also a tad nervous. He looks as though what he's about to say might be painful. We agreed to pretend to be in love, and... He runs a hand through his hair. And I agreed to pay off your medical bills and provide you both with a home and financial support here in Mystic Falls, and in exchange. He pauses for several seconds. She agreed to be my wife and bear my children. But that was before I met you. I gape at him, a half-laugh half-horrified gasp escaping. I believe him. I know it's true because it's what I suspected all along. Lake nods slowly, watching me digest his confession. Yumi wanted the best for you, Kiko. And well, I wanted a family. So today you? I told Yumi the truth. My truth. Your truth? About faded mates. Lake leans forward, capturing my gaze. You might want to sit down for this. I nod in agreement. Yeah, I certainly might. I plop down on the futon and Lake sits beside me. What I told your sister is that it turns out we bear shifters each have one person in the world who's our perfect match. Our other half. Our fated mate. And when we meet that person we just... No. My eyes narrow a bit. 
So what are you saying exactly? He swallows, nodding slowly. You're my fated mate, Kiko. I let out a snort. But somehow I know that's true too. He reaches out, tucking a stray strand of hair behind my ear. From the moment we met I felt this pull. This connection. He slides his glasses up his nose and studies my face before adding. I think you feel it too. I know it's a lot, Kiko. But I swear it's all true. I bite my lip. Why is it so easy for me to believe this crazy story? So what did Yumi say when you broke it off with her? She said that if I don't get you to agree to marry me, she'd be wearing my balls on a chain around her neck. I burst out laughing. That's my sister. And then his words sink in. Wait. You want to marry me? Chapter 13 Kiko is trembling, her whole body buzzing with adrenaline. I can see her stealing glances at my lips, and everything in me wants to kiss her. I want to claim this beautiful woman as mine, now and forever. But I hold back, waiting for her to make her move. And then finally, she opens her mouth and the words spill out. Yes, I'll marry you. That's all I need to hear. Without hesitation, I scoop her up and drag her onto my lap so she's straddling me. I tell myself to take it easy with her, but who am I kidding? There's no use fighting this mate bond. It's like trying to resist a plate of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, impossible. I cup the back of her head and pull her in, savoring the taste of her lips against mine. The desire that courses through me is like wildfire, starting from my mouth and making its way down to my groin and back up to my brain. The air is thick with the intoxicating scent of her arousal, and I can't help but inhale deeply, letting out a low growl. I want to taste every tantalizing flavor she has to offer. She's like a buffet of all the most mouth-watering goodness in the universe. She opens her mouth, inviting me in, and I gladly accept the invitation, slipping my tongue inside to sample her deliciousness. We moan into each other's mouths, the connection between us electric. Her hand caresses my cheek, and I press her against me tightly as if some part of me wants to make sure she never gets too far away. As our tongues dance, letting our shared passion be known, I unfasten the zipper running down her back. Then I drag her dress over her head. Her fingers fumble with the buttons on my dress shirt. I kiss my way down her neck to her chest as she arches her back, moaning in pleasure. With deft fingers I undo her bra, setting her pert breasts free. They're perfect, and I can't hold myself back from sampling them with a hunger that has been building for far too long. Her panting moans only fuel my desire, and I grind my hips against her, feeling the wetness between her legs. She eagerly pushes my shirt down my shoulders, her hands exploring the contours of my muscles. I can feel her heated desire, her urgency, and it spurs me on faster. Kiko is wet and wanting. I can see the desire in her eyes as she takes in the sight of me, and it makes my cock as hard as a rock. As I continue to lavish attention on her breasts, alternating between licking and kissing, I manage to unbuckle my belt, unfasten my pants and free my erection. My hands continue to explore her body, and Kiko's delicate hand wraps around my engorged cock. I release a guttural moan as she jerks me. I seek out her mouth again, my tongue twisting against hers. Then she pulls away and slips off my lap, kneeling in front of me. When our eyes meet, both our gazes are filled with lust and desire. I can't help but let out a sharp intake of breath when her lips brush the head of my cock. The sensation is electric, and I can feel a buzz course through me. Her tongue glides across the velvety tip, teasing me where I'm most sensitive. A bead of precum appears and when she laps it up, I almost lose it. Then her lips slide over my shaft and she takes my length into her mouth and down her throat, sucking gently, and using her hand at the base of my cock. Her head bobs as she strokes me. I growl in ecstasy. This woman owns me. My fingers coil into her hair, tugging gently, and her eyes flutter closed. My thighs quiver. My cock pulses. But when I hear a muffled gag, I hoist her from the floor and carry her to the bed, afraid to steal too much of her oxygen. Taking a brief moment I appreciate the sight before me, Kiko's heavy-lidded eyes, her kiss-swollen lips, her hair like ebony silk. Damn she's unbelievable. I cup the sides of her neck, running my thumbs over her delicate throat. Her body is fragile, breakable, but inside my woman is as strong as steel. You are exquisite. I managed to say, my voice filled with awe and reverence. Kiko smiles, a playful yet seductive curve of her lips as I hook my fingers into the lacy fabric of her panties and slide them down her legs, inhaling deeply as I take in her delicious scent. Mine. I need her, and I need her now. 
but I also want to take my time to pleasure her. I want to be worthy of her. Her fingers run through my hair, sending shivers down my spine. She tugs and bites my lip with a wild and primal intensity as I explore her smooth skin, the curve of her ass, and the softness of her breasts. She's truly the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Then without another word, I press forward, the tip of my hard cock parting her soaked folds. She moans and wriggles against me. My fingers dig into her hips as I guide myself slowly into her channel, giving her all the time she needs to adjust to my size. Her mewling whimpers soon turn into deeper moans of pleasure. Her back arches and her nails dig into my back. She feels incredible, and every slide in and out of her silken depths is one step closer to ecstasy. Our exchange grows more heated with each thrust. My hips drive into her in long rolling motions, making her cry out. Her tightness squeezes me deliciously, and the pleasure twists and coils at the base of my spine. The air is filled with the heady scent of our desire. I can't help but be awestruck by how blessed I am to be fated to this amazing woman. I whisper in her ear, I love you Kiko. I love you so much. That must trigger her because her back arches, and with a wailing cry, she shudders beneath me, surrendering to her orgasm. Her tightness clenches me like a fist as I pepper kisses on her cheek, her temple, her lips, her forehead and her neck, until I can't hold back any longer. Then with a low growl that reverberates around the cabin, I shoot thick ropes of cum into her, filling her with my seed. Chapter 14 As the climax subsides for both of us, we're left totally sated, blissfully happy and entangled in a mess of limbs. Lake wraps his arm around my waist, pulling me against him and nuzzling his face into my neck. With our fingers entwined, we just lie here, holding each other. I marvel at the turn this day has taken. My emotions have run the gamut today, and I'm exhausted. I've gone from anxiety riddled to completely shattered, to euphorically elated. But as much as I'd like to remain here tangled up in Lake all night long, there's something I need to do, and I need to do it right now. Lake, I need to talk to my sister. It can't wait. Escorted by Lake, I push through the doors of the wedding venue, and the sight before me is unexpected. Certainly not your typical wedding scene. Is that? I murmur, squinting. Are they playing poker? Silas, Kate, Zandros, Balin, Waylon, Alice, Hernan, and Louise are all seated around a table, cards and poker chips scattered, engrossed in what appears to be an intense game of Texas Hold'em. They look up as we enter, and Waylon is the first to speak. Finally, he says dramatically, tossing his arms in the air. You sure took your sweet time, Lake. Xandros wears a shit-eating grin. Although, it's understandable. A couple of the women smile knowingly. Wait, do they know what we were doing? Probably. I think back to all the shifter romance books I've read and heat creeps up my cheeks. They probably smell sex on us. Oh my god. I palm my forehead in mortification. What exactly is going on? Lake questions sliding his glasses up the bridge of his nose. Are you or are you not newlyweds? Not. Silas snaps good-naturedly. Not yet anyway. We chose to wait for you two before we continued the ceremony, Kate explains. Then my gaze falls on Yumi. She's at the poker table too, but she's no longer dressed in layers of white tulle, satin and pearls. Nope. Instead she's in a cute floral sundress and sandals. Her expression is mixed, part hopeful, part nervous. Yumi. I begin, my voice shaking just a little. Are you okay with this? She stands up and walks over to me. You're not mad. I was afraid you'd be angry when you found out. Oh, I'm mad. I'm livid, I say. And humbled. And flattered. And grateful to have the best sister in the entire world. I sniffle, wiping a lone tear from the corner of my eye. You're insane, you know that? Marrying just so you could take care of me. I love you so much, but don't ever pull anything like that again. I throw my arms around my sister and we hug each other tightly, like we did when we were kids and had to comfort each other, amid the uncertainty of being shuffled through the foster care system. She won't have to. I hear Lake say behind me. You've got me for that now. Okay, Yumi says, pulling away and wiping her eyes. This family reunion will have to wait. You two have held up this wedding long enough. I gape at her, then at Lake and then at the impatient group still gathered around the poker table. Are you serious right now? My voice trembles as I look around the room. Do I want to get married to Lake today? I meet his eyes and my heart skips a beat. 
Yes. Yes, I really do. Yumi grins, looping her arm through mine. Let's get you in your wedding dress so you can walk down that aisle and get hitched. You mean your wedding dress? She grins one of her wide smiles, the kind that shows all 32 of her teeth. It's yours, now. Epilogue One year later The fire crackles softly, its heat gently caressing my skin, and I can't help but let out a contented sigh. Lake strong arms hold me tight, our bodies entwined on the faux bare skin rug in our home library. I'm still catching my breath. Not from an asthma attack. I haven't had one of those in months. Something about Mystic Hollow is like a healing balm to my lungs. I trace lazy circles on my man's chest as he presses feather-light kisses to my hair. Moments like these, wrapped in the warmth of his embrace, feel like a dream. It's hard to believe this is my reality now. After a time, Lake's deep timbre rumbles against my cheek, his breath tickling my ear as he speaks. Would you like me to read to you, mate? My eyes light up with mischief and I hide a grin. I'd love that. It's something we do frequently, take turns reading aloud to one another after we make love. Great. Choose a book then. I glance around the room, taking in the vast collection of books lining the walls. Slipping from his arms, I hurry over to the reading nook, reach under one of the oversized blue pillows and retrieve what I've been hiding from him. Clutching it to my chest, I return to the warmth of Lake's side. Here. I hand him the bound pages. His brow furrows for a moment before a playful smile tugs at the corner of his mouth. What's this? It's a bear shifter romance. Written by me. It's called Forbidden Fates. His lips quirk. Is this a story about us? Maybe, I say coyly, wriggling closer to him. Don't worry, I changed the names. The rest of the world will think it's fiction. He flips through the first few pages, amusement dancing in his eyes. You're Blake, by the way, I tell him. Am I? He chuckles, clearly amused. And what's your alias? Shakira. I smile smugly. Now, are you going to read or what? All right, all right. Lake concedes, holding up the manuscript and pushing his glasses up into a comfortable reading position. Let's see what adventures our supposedly fictional but not really counterparts get up to. His rich voice wraps around me like a caress as I listen to him read our story. And as he continues to read, his voice weaving its magic spell around me, I thank the stars, the heavens above, and fate for this man. I can't wait until he gets to the epilogue where Shakira and Blake make love on a faux bearskin rug, before Blake reads aloud from Shakira's manuscript and learns that she's pregnant. With twins. Note from the authors. You might be wondering what happened to Marla, what happened to the wolf storyline, and did these authors just choose to leave their readers hanging? No. We wouldn't do that to you. Marla's story unfolds in book one of the next series, Wolf's Captive. Oh, and if you're wondering what happened to Yumi, no worries there either. She's got a story in the next series as well, smiley face. To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel. We hope you have enjoyed this computer-generated audio production of Temporary Mate by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. The first book in the next series is Wolf's Captive.